you have weeping, and you have joy, and you have a lot of that in between. Okay? You weep with those who weep, and you joy with those who have joy. Okay? Rejoice with those who rejoice. Gary? I was going to say that the burden that we have, Christ wants to teach us that we can put those burdens on Him. And we need to rely on Him in everything. And that will make our burden light. And that is why you don't go through this alone. And you will never be alone because Christ is always with you. Because He lives in you. Amen. <coughs> But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from who? The evil, the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. And what is truth? <laughs> Father, your word is is truth. You understand the bigger picture of what that last part means? What is truth? It says the word is truth, right? Mm -hmm. What's another name for Jesus? Truth. John says in the beginning of his gospel, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Jesus Christ is truth. That truth comes directly from God the Father. Everything that Jesus said came from His Father. Jesus is truth. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I said last week, and I'll say it again, and I'll continue to say it, the most important thing you need to know and you need to have in your heart is Jesus Christ. Amen. Do you realize that you can memorize your Bible from beginning to end, from Genesis to Revelation, and if you don't know Jesus, it's going to profit you nothing? Outside of Christ, you have no hope or power or ability to overcome your own sinful nature. Christ, when He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, He meant every word of that. Aren't you glad that He wasn't worried about being politically correct? Don't you hope that there are still people today who don't care about being politically correct? Amen. Who will stand and tell you that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life? And that there is no other way to the Father except through Him? Amen. One way. And it's always been that way. From eternity past through eternity future, there's only one way to the Father, and that is through the Son. Amen. Amen. As you sent me into the world, I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified by the truth. Turn with me to John 13. Let's look at verses 34 and 35. Now listen. That whole prayer that I read, let me ask you a question. How important is the unity of the church to Jesus. Absolutely. It is of the utmost importance. These are some of his last words before he's taken to the cross. Past this prayer, what's the only other prayer that Jesus prays? It's more than one. Before he actually gives up his life. I can think of two. Three. <laughs> the first one is, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass. He said that three times. The second one was, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And the third one was, Father, into your hands, commend my spirit. Think of those prayers, and think of this one that he's praying before he goes to the cross. How important is the unity of his church, the unity of his believers, to Jesus himself? Is it, is it of utmost importance? Amen. If he had a top five list, would it be right up there in the top? Now the question is, is how important is that unity to you? And what are you willing to 
his sacrifice to continue to have that unity. Because the only thing God is asking you to sacrifice is your own personal pride. Because when you're able to do that, the rest is easy. Because the rest is Christ. So John 13, verses 34 and 35. Jesus says, A new commandment I give to you, that you what? That you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Verse 35. By, all, by this, all will know that you are my disciples, if what? Yeah. If you have love for one another. It's Jesus telling us here. Jesus tells us that our public witness is closely related to the way that we treat one another. Other versions say, you must love one another. What kind of love is Jesus talking about here? How many types of love are spoken of in the Bible? I think there's four. I can only remember three. There is eros love. There is phileo love. And there is agape love. And I think there's one more, and I can never remember what that one is. Is it? Is it Veronica? Eros. Yeah, Eros. Yeah. Is that word? But so I gave you the three out of the four. You have an idea of what they are. Okay? Do you know what Philip Phileo love is? Brother. Brother. Yeah, it's where you get the whole name for the, the city of Philadelphia. Okay? That's why it's called the city of brotherly love. It may have been that when they first started it, but it didn't look that Okay. Jesus said that you love one another. Now, what did he say? A new commandment. Is this the 11th commandment? No. But he does say, a new commandment I give to you. So if Jesus, who, uh, let me ask you this question. Who was it that penned the 10 commandments with his own finger? Okay, so if he gave that great law, and now he's saying a new commandment I give you. Is this an important commandment? Yes. yes. Why do we treat it as if it doesn't matter? Do you understand now why the majority of Christian churches hang on this? They have a right there. They understand that. And it is important. Jesus said, there's no getting around that. Jesus said, a new commandment I give to you. That you love one another. And if you love one another, that's the way the world's going to know that I'm real. Okay? So what kind of love is he talking about? He's talking about Eros love? No. He's talking about Phileo love? No. He's talking about the one I can't remember? No. <laughs> Could be because I don't remember what it is, but no. He's talking about that one kind of love, right? Agape. Because he, it's not really a new command. But he showed us and he modeled for us mm -hmm. agape love. And it's really not a new commandment, but he deepened it. He showed us this is the Ten Commandments. I am, he said. I'm living it for you. Okay. And the Jews walked around in this mechanical thing like they thought they were religious. He says, you don't even know what religion is. Ricky, what is, what is your understanding of agape love? Love that only God can love us. An unconditional love, but I think it's even, it goes even deeper than a mother's love for a child. Oh, yeah, I agree with that. It's uh, supernatural. It is very good. Supernatural. Let me ask you this. When Jesus said, you must be born again, and when Paul tells us that we are a new creation, the old has passed, the new has come, what kind of love does God give us in that new birth? Phileo love? Brotherly love? Do you understand that? He gives us agape love. The very love of God. And how does that come? It only comes through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Agape love, a love that emanates from God, can only come from God. And you can only have it and give it if God is living inside of you. Amen. We quoted half a verse, but it goes so well with your sermon, Matthew 11. Okay. 
Okay. And 30. Take Can you read my, that for us? Yeah. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest for, for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is easy. Amen. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. You guys familiar with this one? How many of you ever been to a wedding? <laughs> a good chance you might hear this tomorrow. <laughs> What is this chapter called? Love chapter. The love chapter. Now, what kind of love? What's the definition of this word love that is used here in this chapter? Do you understand that? When you read this, this is how God sees you. This is how God relates to you. And this is the presence that God has given you wrapped up in Jesus Christ that now you're able to give this love to each other. Exactly. I was going to ask you a question, but I won't put you on the spot. Uh, I'll use myself as the example. I have been married now for 20... said these words, that I would have this kind of love for her. Okay? I got their love. Now, Ray, did you take those vows? Oh, yeah. You don't mind if I put Ray in the spot, do you? Radio. You guys don't mind Ray, don't <laughs> <laughs> well, Ray spot. So, Ray, you and me, we took these vows, right? How long did it take from after saying those vows to where you just, you broke that vow, showing her that you got their love? I probably failed, failed miserably the very day. Let me come down and shake your hand, brother, because you have a lot of love. Right. Well, I mean, do you understand that? This is what God gives us. And this is what we can be. This is how high the bar is set. This is what God sees our potential to be. That we can give that kind of love if He lives within us. And it can be done. There is no if, ands, or buts. The problem isn't on God's side. The problem is always in Okay. If you give it, you have less than your next time. Share. And you will never run out of that love. If God lives inside of you, you will never run out because Jesus told the lady at the well, I will give you water, and then when you drink it, then you'll never thirst again. And she said, Give me that water. And he says, I am that water. Because when Jesus lives inside your heart, and you have that love, Listen, Ricky used this, um, this term in Sabbath school class quite a few times. Uh, it was a term of byproduct, okay? Uh, and that obedience is a byproduct of knowing Christ. But love is also a byproduct of knowing Christ. It, and you can't know Christ without having that in you. And, and it continues to build. If I wasn't allowed to preach, I find this out when I don't preach for weeks at a time, that there is something that builds inside of me that, that I've got to let it out. And there is something inside of me that I have to share. And if I preach week after week after week, there comes times when it is hard for me to put the sermon together. But if I don't have anything to do for two weeks, I wrote four sermons in, in, in a two-hour period. Okay? I don't usually write sermons. I write outlines. Okay. This is why I'm standing behind this thing so much because if I don't stay there and read that thing, I just go like it. God lives in you and God will give you joy, peace, love, all the fruits of the Spirit. And it will build inside of you and it has to come out. You understand? Amen. Amen. The devil will give you his fruits of the Spirit as well and it won't stay inside either. It has to come out. Right? This is why God tells you that you will know His people by the love they have for each other. Because the Spirit of God living inside of you will come out as agape love to one another. Amen. Amen. First Corinthians 13. Let's look at verses 4 through 7. says love. 
You know, you can actually put the word God in there, or you can put Jesus in there, and it'll be the same thing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. Love is not what? What does that word puffed up mean? Full of pride. Full of pride. I like that. Verse 5. Love does not behave. What? That's something that cuts me right to the heart because I can be a very rude person. Love does not seek its own. Love is not provoked. And love thinks what? No evil. Do you realize that when God looks at you, that's what he sees? God doesn't think evil about you. My conscience thinks evil about myself because I know me. But God knows me better and God does not think evil about me. I have a hard time accepting that. Thank you. <laughs> but you see, with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit helps me to understand the depth of God's love. I told you guys this before. I can understand how He could love you. But I don't really understand why He could love me, because I know me. But I can understand you guys. I have a love for you guys. And that love is nothing compared to what God has. There are those here that have a love for each other that is strong that is powerful. And what we need is to have that in everybody. Amen. So as I start to wind this down, the question is, is how do we have that kind of love and unity when we disagree? Or when we hurt each other's feelings? Or when we let each other down? The disagreement. Take what he just said. Is, he said that the disagreement is what allows us to be honest. Is controversy a bad thing? No. Do you hear what Doc said again? Controversy is necessary. So when God makes diverse people, and He brings them into one house and puts them into one family, are you going to have conflict? Yes. Of course. Conflict is a powerful tool for transformation. The problem is how we deal with conflict, how we handle it. There are those who run away from conflict. There are those who meet it aggressively. There are those who uh, fall in the middle of that, the passive aggressive ones. Dangerous. Dangerous ones. Good. Those are the dangerous ones. So, the next few weeks, what I'm going to be bringing you is the tools of handling conflict. The biblical approach to be handling conflict. And I'm going to need, uh, can I use that chalkboard that you have in your room? Because I'm going to need to write now. Now, know this, my writing is not good. <laughs> so I may need to bring in a pinch hitter who has good handwriting. Right, okay. I've been practicing for 52 years. And it's, as bad. it's as bad today as it was when I was in. Uh, uh, Catholic school and the nuns used to smack your hands with the ruler if you did not write right. Did you notice Donald's sign when you come in this morning? Uh, no. Are your shirt you Yes. Actually, I didn't get to read it because it was the last one that I remember. Uh, but anyway, let's, let me close here. So, um, again, let's go back to 13. Verse what? Love does not rejoice in what? What does that mean, that love does not rejoice in sin? Do you understand? It's not telling you that love does not rejoice in your own sin. It's telling you that love does not rejoice in others' sin. That when others fall into sin, others within the church family, that it is not our place to gossip, to talk, or to drive them away. Let me ask you a question. Who here in the church this morning, and again, be honest, did not sin in the last 48 hours? Okay, now I can, I can go down to, to like 24 hours, and we can go down to 6 hours, and we can go to whatever. But you get the point. Let me raise your hand. 
But there are some sins that the church you know, has no biggie. And there are others that will drive each other out from it because of it. Our job is to restore. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Our calling is to restore. Our calling at times is to confront. Is that right? Because we are not to keep silent with sin. Okay? But we are to keep the fellowship. So again, how do we keep the fellowship when we're talking about sin of the brethren? Do you know what the greatest sin in the church is? Say it loudly. Gossip. That is the greatest. And do you realize that gossip is listed right there with the seven deadly sins? And it's right next to murder? Because that's what gossip is. Is a form of murder. But you know, gossip, the sin of gossip, is a uh, sin that the church has baptized and made okay. Shouldn't be that way, brothers and sisters. Jesus made this plain. And in the Gospel of Matthew, it says plainly, if you have a problem with your brother, what are you to do? You are to go to your brother. These are the steps that need to be taken. You don't go to your friend. You don't go to the elder or the pastor. You go to the brother. And you... Now listen, actually, what it says, if, if your brother has something against you, you yeah. see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But it's, it's a two-way street. Right. We'll get into that again next week. So, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, love believes all things, love hopes all things, but most of all, love what? Endures. Endures all things. Brothers and sisters, love never fails, but whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, and I understood as a child, and I thought as a child. But when I became a man, when I grew up, I put away childish things. Brothers and sisters, if there's one thing that I think Jesus would tell us today in this church, for some of us, it is the counsel to just grow up. <laughs> grow up. Be a man or be a woman. Stop being a child. We look at children and they bicker and they argue and they want this and they want that and they take this and they take that. And we say that's childish behavior. But there are a lot of us who have never grown out of that. There are a lot of us who uh, incorporated that to be successful in this world. So as I end, the love that Jesus wants us to show has no room for unresolved conflict. And so next week, we will get into how to deal with with conflict within the church and between the brethren. Our closing in this morning is in number 524.